Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, uh, for the privilege that we have to uh, open the Word of God together, uh, to sing your praises, to magnify your name, uh, to be encouraged with uh, what awaits us in glory, a reminder of the awful consequence uh, that will befall those who reject the Saviour, and the encouragement to us to be about your business. Uh, as we have uh, looked at the Lamb, uh, thank you, Father, that uh, even if we were to spend uh, the rest of our days every day looking to the Lamb, we would not exhaust that which is there. Uh, we would never plumb the depth of your revelation regarding your Son. So we thank you for this time, uh, for the fellowship of it, for the encouragement and blessing of uh, all that you're able to accomplish for us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon uh, is my last opportunity and uh, I feel that there is so much that has been left unsaid. And uh, I hope I haven't tried to put too much into things and uh, end up by uh, leaving you with a jumble uh, of thoughts, but uh, rather... Uh, we'd like to have us look to the Lamb, pure and precious, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. If you would uh, follow along, please, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning, uh, Peter is uh, he's a fisherman, isn't he? His mind's all over the place, he's uh, been sanctified, and uh, he is so full of uh, the things of God that he, uh, he, um, he just uh, bubbles over with uh, joy and enthusiasm. But uh, beginning in chapter 1, uh, we'll start in verse 13 and uh, go to uh, the end of the chapter. Uh, Wherefore, gird up the lines of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were redeemed with, not redeemed with corruptible things, a silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The grace of God and a handful of gems, precious gems, uh, are the subject of uh, Peter's uh, writings. Uh, there are some things that are referred to as precious, uh, five of them in uh, First Peter. Uh, the first one we see in verse 7, uh, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of our faith is precious to God. And sometimes it's not that precious to us, is it? Because we see it as an intrusion. We see it as an invasion of our plans, our purposes, and uh, yet all along it's the purpose of God to try to refine, to purify 
uh, to hone and uh, whittle away at the dross and make our faith pure. Then we see in uh, this uh, verse here, uh, verse number 19 of uh, chapter 1, uh, that the blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot is precious, valuable, beyond measure in value. And then in chapter 2 and verse 4, uh, we find, uh, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Christ, as the living stone, is precious to God. Then we see in verse number 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Christ, the cornerstone, is precious. Then in verse 7, uh, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made uh, the head of the corner. So Christ as the headstone is precious. The trying of our faith, faith by which we come to Christ in the first place, uh, by means of the blood, Christ being the living stone, this is not a dead faith, it's not a, a dead relationship, it's not uh, a formality of membership uh, in an institution with a, a name on a roll. Christ, our cornerstone, the foundation, uh, the first thing that is put there, uh, the large stone in the corner off which everything is measured. And isn't it a wonder that we can measure everything, every aspect of our life from the cornerstone that is Christ? And then when the building is done and the, the, the last, the capstone, the finishing of the top, the completion, is Christ himself again. A wonderful, wonderful reminder of all that we have in Christ. We see him in uh, this verse 19 of chapter 1, uh, tied together with the Passover lamb again, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Our needs are met in the lamb. And when we think back on uh, the Passover lamb just quickly, uh, we found uh, that he was for our protection. Uh, we are vulnerable in the world without Christ, are we not? We find him as our covering. We find him as our safety. Uh, we find him as a guarantee of a new beginning. We find him our deliverer, sheltering under the grace and provision of God. Is there a better place for us to be? until we get to heaven and until we stand around that throne, until we can sing that new song, perhaps a different verse than those of the tribulation saints, in a language we don't yet know. But what a prospect. We can look forward to that and we can all sing. And it's been great to sit next to Brad and have people behind me singing and, and hearing the harmonies and the people chipping in with the little echo and all that sort of thing. And that's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, it, it's refreshing. It's an encouragement. Can't imagine what it will be like around the throne. Glorified body, glorified voice, glorified mind with which to comprehend what we're saying to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Peter begins here with a reminder of what they were in their former conversation, their former lifestyle, their former uh, citizenship. Uh, they belonged to the devil John chapter 8 tells us that every unbeliever is a child of the devil. Awful beginning. We are all in Adam's family, lost, not because of the sins we've committed, but because we are born of him. He describes uh, this circumstance uh, as being in former lusts, in ignorance of the grace and the love of God, unbelieving of the judgment of God, not accepting the grace of God, nor the eternal consequences of the decision that needs to be made. What were we as sinners? This passage describes it as being empty, vain conversation, unprofitable life, handed down by our ancestors, other sinners. And what do they know about eternal life? What do they know about this life? What do we have from them? In spiritual terms, uh, the Bible tells us here that it is a worthless tradition, a bondage resulting in death, a worthless tradition of paganism. If you're a Gentile, 
bowing down to an idol, uh, religious zeal, legalistic religion if you were a Jew. Uh, there being no power in uh, the words that the scribes and the Pharisees would offer. And uh, when we read of the Lord Jesus in uh, the uh, uh, Gospel of Matthew in particular, uh, where many times he says, you have heard it said. And he quotes what the Pharisees have said, which is a distortion of what the Bible has said. Uh, and then he says, but I say unto you. And at the end of that, we read that the people marveled that he spoke to them with clarity and with power and with authority, not quoting Rabbi so-and-so who quoted Rabbi so-and-so who quoted Rabbi so-and-so, but quoting from the very word of God in its purity and its in simplicity. Vain, empty, unprofitable, handed down from our ancestors, lifeless, fruitless, without joy, addicted to an endless pursuit of satisfying the flesh. That's how we were. Ugly picture, isn't it? We ought to recognize it as the ugly picture that it is. And deserving of all the condemnation that Brother Tracy pointed out to us earlier on about the lake of fire. Uh, awful, beyond comprehension place for them. That was not intended for the unbeliever, first of all, but for Satan. Selfishness that can't be satisfied. We talk about substance abuse, like we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. When I was a kid, post-traumatic stress disorder was called shell shock, mm -hmm. graphic, personal, powerful, awful. Uh, substance abuse is not some, and I ha this is another one I don't like much, uh, inappropriate behavior. It's, it's nothing inappropriate about sin, it's disgusting. It's not that it's inappropriate that makes it bad. Sanitized. We live in a sanitized world and uh, people like to imagine themselves as being sanitized by their own good works. Alcoholics lying in their own vomit, choking to death. It's a degrading picture. With Sister Jenny, we were talking about people in an old folks home. Uh, survivors of a life of addiction, uh, of substance abuse alcohol abuse, alcohol poisoning of their bodies with dementia, unable to comprehend even who their family are. Drug addicts lying in an alley with a needle hanging out of their arm. Derelict, perhaps having overdosed on a pure dose than they got yesterday. Seeking desperately for rest and satisfaction. They won't find it. And we think of them as awful people, terrible, dregs of society. But according to the scripture, as sinners, they are no different to the woman uh, in her shawl with her long dress, uh, with bleeding hands and knees, crawling up the steps of a cathedral, seeking to offer penance for her sins. Or the educated man in his suit, going into a little booth and confessing his sins to a man and calling him father. The benevolent giver to charity, the philanthropist, the self-righteous, pharisaical hypocrite that proclaims his own good deeds. Same as a drug addict, same as a drunkard, same as a prostitute. All vile, all ugly, all their righteousnesses as filthy rags. And the wonder of it is that God loves them. The Lamb of God gave his precious blood that they would have life. All have sinned, all have missed the mark, all have gone astray, all need cleansing, all need to be forgiven, all with a sin debt that they cannot pay, spiritually bankrupt before a righteous and a holy God. Aren't you glad we have the blood of Christ, precious blood of Christ that we can plead? What has the Lord done in response to this? He has shed his blood. We can buy freedom from slavery with silver and gold. A paltry sum of 30 pieces of silver will set a slave free. That's what they paid for the Lord Jesus. And Judas threw the money into the potter's field. But there is no amount of silver or gold that can purchase freedom from sin, forgiveness of sin. If it could, if religion was enough, if uh, self-righteousness was adequate 
uh, then why did Christ die? Why was the precious blood shed? Makes no sense at all, does it? Only by the one payment, by the one qualified, can redeem the sinner. Turn, please, if you would, uh, to uh, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, for a wonderful look at this matter of payment. Isaiah 55 and verse 1, the prophet declares, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's free to us. Christ paid the ultimate price, but it's free to us. Only the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb can save. What has he done? He has redeemed us. Peter reminds us as a Christian, as he writes to those uh, scattered uh, abroad in his day, uh, to encourage them with who they are and what they are, and that they would have a context for their hardships and their sufferings and uh, all the pain and anguish of life. It reminds them that they're redeemed. They have been purchased back, uh, even as a prisoner of war, and that's in the picture of that word redeemed. Uh, one captured by the enemy, uh, that uh, you have gone and you have paid the money and you've brought them back. Back to where they belong. We all belong to God in the first place, do we not? It's a wicked one that has snatched us from him, blinded our eyes to the truth. He wants to procure us for his own possession. And then having paid the price, he sets us free. Says, you owe me nothing. But it would be good if you would honour me. It's a very gentle opportunity he gives us, isn't it? Uh, he could demand everything, even as the Apostle Paul, uh, when he gets to Romans chapter 12, after all the heavy doctrinal things and uh, the wonderful foundation of who we are and uh, the righteousness of Christ. And then in chapter 12 he begins, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He could have said, I demand as the great Apostle Paul, do this or else. But he says, I beg you, I beg you, would you present your body a living sacrifice as your choice as what you would freely give to a God who has given you everything. Redeemed from all iniquity. We're lawbreakers, each one of us. But we are thankful, are we not, for the one who has come to fulfill the law, who has said there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. But the scars remain, don't they? You've heard of the, the little boy that was told by his father that every time he did something wrong, uh, he had to go and uh, hammer a nail in the door. And uh, day after day, the little boy would make mistakes and he would do things wrong and he'd disobey his parents and uh, dad would take him out there and give him a nail and a hammer and he'd, he'd whack that nail in the door. And the door was nearly full and he's trying to teach his son uh, forgiveness. Uh, and he would go and he would pull all the nails out and he said, it's all forgiven, it's all forgiven, all forgiven, all forgiven. And the little boy said, but look at the door. The door is a wreck. The scars are there, but the nails are gone. The forgiveness has been offered. But our, sometimes uh, our life bears the scars of that which was in former days. We're reconciled as well uh, by the blood of the Lamb. We are strangers no more. I can come into this place, I can go to any church except for that strange one in Queensland uh, and uh, I can uh, find fellowship and, uh, and there is a, a connection, there's an immediate connection. Um, you can go anywhere around the world, you don't even have to know their language, uh, they don't know yours. Uh, if you can uh, make the connection that uh, they're a Christian, you're a Christian, uh, there is a bond, is there not? Uh, all reconciled, all together in the family. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Brother Tracy mentioned that before he was saved, uh, he had uh, trouble with that, with uh, acknowledging that. One of the saddest things uh, that I have uh, uh, seen uh, in a long time, uh, I was invited to attend a funeral uh, of a relative of one of our church people. Uh, I wasn't uh, taking the funeral. Uh, I was there as uh, one of the congregation. 
Uh, the, the minister was a man from a, a mainline de denomination, and I won't say who and I won't say his name, uh, but one of the, the, the hymns uh, on the order of service was Amazing Grace. Uh, and he stopped the congregation uh, and, and he looked at that verse and he said, I don't like that. We are not going to sing that saved a wretch like me because I'm not a wretch. You're not a wretch. The person in this coffin is not a wretch. We're going to sing saved a one like me. He was a preacher of the gospel. So he claimed to be. Wouldn't acknowledge that he was a wretch in need of a saviour. The message that he gave was empty, it was hollow, it had no power, had no hope, had nothing for a room full of people that needed to hear that there was a God in heaven that loves them. Forgiven, set free from the burden. We're reminded of Pilgrim, were we not, where he had the sack, the burden of his sin. He could cast it down and then continue uh, in a new life, unburdened with that. Uh, and to learn and to have the trials and the troubles and uh, all the difficulties of walking as a Christian. But justified, justified, declared to be righteous when we have no righteousness of our own. And as Brother Tracy pointed out the other day, it's not just a pardon, it's not an acquittal, it's as if there is no record, there is no record at all. God's declaration, and it is so. Saved from his wrath, He's not angry anymore. The terror of wrongdoing is not a burden that we need to bear. Cleansing from sin we have by the blood of Christ. But we bear the marks, sometimes physically. Uh, we still have the tattoos. Uh, we still have uh, different parts that we can't remove as a reminder, perhaps, of what we once were. And those reminders aren't necessarily a bad thing, are they? They would sometimes perhaps give us a, an opening with an individual who is still burdened with the same guilt, troubled by the same things, uh, having the same uh, conflict of mind or the confusion, uh, having no peace that we have. We find uh, that also uh, we are sanctified by position permanently and progressively. Wouldn't it be good if the day you were saved you were complete and you were perfect? There was no more trouble with sin. Uh, there was no more Romans chapter 7. I do the things I don't want to do and I find I can't do the things that I want to do. And my heart is in a turmoil. Uh, uh, I am troubled. Uh, I, I have opportunity to be led by the Spirit. Uh, I'm told uh, uh, to be filled by Him. And yet I have to live a life with a, a sinful old nature that keeps on dragging me back. It's going to come a day when all that's gone. Thing of the past. Burden no more, sanctified permanently before the throne of grace forever. Set apart, set apart from the old life. Uh, we're not to continue on in our old ways. Uh, uh, there is nothing uh, more uh, difficult to deal with. There's nothing more discouraging for people. Uh, there's nothing uh, that is a more poor testimony than a Christian who is living as though they have the old life still uh, as the dominant influence in their life. Uh, one foot in the world and one foot in the Christian life, you've heard it before, maybe you've tried it. Most uncomfortable thing anybody could ever do. Why would you do it? We don't need to do it. It doesn't have to be that way. The Lord has enabled us to live above that. We are sanctified, we're separated, not just from the old life, but we are separated unto the Lord. Uh, separated, set aside, uh, made special for His purpose. Uh, we ought to have no um, idea that we, we are free to do as we please. Uh, when we became a Christian, we surrendered all right to our personal life. Didn't we? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? It's not I, but Christ that liveth in me. That's supposed to be a reality. It's not just a Bible verse. And it can be a reality, can't it? Because of the precious blood of the Lamb. John Brown, the 19th century Scottish theologian, uh, in talking about holiness, uh, says this. He says, Holiness does not consist of mystic speculations, enthusiastic fervors, uh, or uncommanded austerities. It consists in thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. Neither does holiness mean, as it is often thought, adhering to a list of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts. When Christ came into the world, he said, I have come to do thy will, O 
God. This is the example we are to follow in all our thoughts, all our actions, in every part of our character. The ruling principle that motivates and guides us should be the desire to follow Christ in doing the will of the Father. This is the high road we must follow in the pursuit of holiness. And we can do that because of the precious blood of Christ. Salvation for the sinner comes uh, as uh, we are reminded here uh, in uh, verse 20. Uh, who verily was foreordained, uh, this is the Lord Jesus, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. If he is the forerunner, he is then also an author and finisher of our faith that we read of in uh, the book of Hebrews. And as the author, the Lord Jesus therefore must know everything about himself, about his work, about us, there is nothing hidden from him. The idea of uh, being uh, the author has to do with him being the originator of. Uh, it all begins with him. It starts with him and it finishes with him uh, because in author and finisher, he is Alpha and Omega. There is nothing in between uh, that he is not uh, in uh, uh, full possession uh, of knowledge regarding. Uh, there's nothing that escapes his notice. He's qualified to be the author of our salvation because... He must know everything there is to know about humanity and its need. And he does. He knows about your need, about your family's need, knows about my need, he knows about Brother Brad's need. Uh, he wouldn't tell you this, but he's been to 60 churches and there's only five that's supporting him. And he didn't ask me to say that either, and I hope I don't embarrass you by that. Uh, but he's going anyway. Because God's called him. And God will take care of the money, He'll take care of the health for the children. Uh, we've had people, uh, people have said to me uh, in, um, in a veiled sort of a way, a little bit critical, saying, how can a man take his family uh, to Africa, to a place where it's difficult, where uh, children get abducted, people get murdered? That happens in Melbourne. It's no different. <laughs> Thing is, if God wants uh, Brother Brad and Lydia and the family in Ghana, then he'll take care of them there. And he would be the most miserable of men if he stayed here. Or if he stayed in Rockhampton or Grafton or Melbourne or uh, wherever he is at the moment, he needs to be where God's put him. Because God is the author. God is the caller. God is the enabler. He knows everything about him. The Lord Jesus must have all power to save the vilest of sinners and the most desperately needy, or he has no power at all. And you and I know some needy and desperate people that he's saved. And every time you get up in the morning to have your shave or do your hair, you're looking at one of them. He can do that. Aren't you glad he did? He must have all knowledge of every person to be ever present in every place so as to be able to be all-sufficient, sustainer, enabler, encourager, empowerer. Nothing is beyond him. The Lord is suitable only the Lord is suitable. Only the Lord is capable. Only the Lord is available at all, at all time. You can get up and pray to him in the middle of the night. And um, uh, we all know this. Uh, we know God uh, understands everything and uh, we know he knows every language and uh, he knows even uh, the thoughts and intents of our heart and the, and the groanings that can't be uttered. He knows that. Uh, but when you go and, and you pray in some other place and, and there's some Aussies there and there's some others and there's some Chinese and there's some Arabic people and, and there's some other nationality people, Hungarian people, whatever, uh, and they all start praying in their own language in a little prayer meeting. And it just struck me that God knows it all. He understands me. He understands that Chinese man. He understands that Italian lady. Uh, and they're all uh, tens of thousands, uh, perhaps millions. And we know there are millions even in China alone. There are millions of people praying in languages we have never heard. And God understands it all and he knows it all and he's able to provide for all. And he has invited all those to trust in him, to shelter under his blood as the Passover lamb that's sufficient for them. Who but he is perfect and without sin? Who but he is the perfect sacrifice? Who but he could be our substitute? Who but he can satisfy a righteous and a holy God? Who but he has shed his blood 
and able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The plan originated with him. The wisdom ordered it, came from him. The work of the cross and all that was accomplished on it came from him. Salvation, full and free, eternal. The Lord is able. Sometimes uh, we, I think, devalue what the Lord is able to do. Uh, I would like to just uh, tell you of a, a little story. Um, it relates to this uh, portion in um, verses 22 and onwards, uh, where he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. That's what Christ has done for us, but then now there is something that we ought to be doing for him. Uh, not to merit salvation, not to uh, demonstrate um, uh, anything other than a, a consequence of what he has done. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Love without hypocrisy. Uh, love without hidden things. Love without agendas. Love without lists. Love without conditions. See that ye love one another. Not the human love, not the brotherly love, not the affectionate love, not the friendship, uh, but the love that 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of, uh, the one that is long-suffering, uh, the one that is selfless, the one that is denying of self, the one that has the other person in mind constantly. Love one another with a pure heart. Pure heart. Not divided. Purged of self. Cleansed of sin. Fervently. With a passion. Unfeigned love of the brethren with a pure heart, fervently. Picture is a boiling over, a love boiling over. If you've got a pot, a saucepan on the, on the stove and it's boiling over, uh, there is nothing you can do with that until that substance run dry, short of taking it off the fire. Is our love like that for one another? Is our love like that for the lost? Uh, is it from a pure heart? Is it boiling over? Is it fervent? Is it passionate? Is it all-consuming is the picture there? Selfless, uncontainable. Gospel John says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Uh, it ought to be the hallmark. It is the hallmark. It is the God-given hallmark. It is the stamp that makes us authentic. Uh, if we don't have love for one another, if it's not seen in us, uh, then people will wonder, is this a genuine thing? Are these people real? They say they love me, but they look at me with condemnation. Uh, they look at my earring and my nose ring and uh, everything else that's uh, up there that ought not to be there, uh, and they write me off. They dismiss me as uh, one of these addicts, one of these unworthies. Uh, is that the love of God? The way they treat one another. Uh, the church split down the road and the people that got angry about this and angry about that, and they argue about the carpet and this and that. Uh, is that love? for the brethren? Is that love for one another? Is that how we ought to be? Uh, is that the product of the shed blood of Christ for us? Must be better than that, surely. Must be better than that. Norman Grubb in his book, um, Cricketer and Pioneer, uh, writes of a time when uh, uh, CT is uh, in uh, the, the depth of Congo uh, and uh, his, uh, his health is really poor. Uh, he's hardly got any teeth left in his head and the ones he's got are in terrible condition uh, and people are praying uh, uh, that God would somehow fix this man's teeth. In the middle of the jungle. Uh, three weeks uh, journey by canoe up the, the river and then a, a, a long walk uh, through the jungle. And while there are people in the Congo praying that his teeth would be fixed, uh, there is a dentist in England uh, asking the Lord to give him a burden for what to do with his life. And God speaks to his heart. And he says, C.T. Stud needs some teeth. So he asks for some people to help him, uh, for some passage money to get there, to uh, make that journey to the, to the Congo to give this man some teeth. Nobody helps him. So he sells his dental practice. He loads up his stuff. 
He takes his suitcase and his bits and pieces for dental work and he's on a canoe uh, going up the river when coming down the river on the other way uh, is uh, one of C.T. Studd's daughters and Mr. Buxton who are going back to England for some relief and they meet in the middle of the river uh, and they pull up and they have a time of fellowship and a time of prayer and uh, they go back to England and this man who has sold his dental practice with his bits and pieces is going into the middle of the jungle to make this man some teeth. Because God loved him. And he loved that man in the jungle. And he wanted to give that dentist an opportunity to be a blessing. Fervent love, one for another. Pure, passionate love that comes from the Lamb of God who has taken away our sins, purged us from all unrighteousness, cleansed us from our sin, put our feet upon a rock, given us a hope in this life and the wonders of glory to come. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who uh, was obedient unto death, uh, who before the foundation of the world with the Father and the Holy Spirit, before anything was made, uh, purposed together that at the appropriate time uh, the son would be given and the child would be born and the lamb would be slain. And that for thousands of years before this event there would be instruction, there would be example, there would be type, there would be shadow, there would be revelation of this wonderful reality. And that he would come and take away the sin of the world. And the vile and the guilty would receive the love of God and be enabled to take it to a world that is lost. Father, help us uh, to live as we ought to live as your children, uh, to be as we ought to be, uh, open to your leading, uh, willing to go, to do, uh, to pay, uh, whatever price uh, you could ask a price that would never be high enough. Would you give us opportunity to demonstrate our love for one another? Uh, would you give us a desire to do it? That it would be uh, with passion boiling over, uh, uncontainable in its enthusiasm, deep, that it would last. Father, we thank you that you're able and we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.